Hey guys, welcome to chapter 15, otherwise known as the Civil War chapter. I feel like before I begin, there should be a big giant flashing warning sign at the top of your screen right now saying, warning, warning, the Civil War is still a controversial topic 150 years after it was fought. And that's just it. The Civil War still is a controversial topic, and there are controversial things about this war, about why it was fought, and um, what ultimately happened, and everything else about this war. So here's the deal. I'm going to go ahead and be upfront about this. I am not an expert in the Civil War. But, but Mullen, you're an AP US teacher. You should be an expert in everything in US history. No, that's not the case at all. Have I taken classes on the Civil War? Yes. Have I gone to museums and looked at exhibits about the Civil War? Yes. Have I read a bunch of books and seen a bunch of Civil War movies? Yes. Would I call myself an expert? No. I haven't studied it that much. If I did study it that much, I would have written a book and I'd be a college professor discussing the Civil War. My point here is, if the narrative that I'm going to tell you is a narrative that I learned when I went through college with some stuff that I've learned uh, since added in there, um, Again, I have taken uh, classes on the Civil War, so I'll give you the best story that I can. Am I going to guarantee that this is the story that everyone accepts is true? Well, that's kind of the funny thing about studying history. Not everyone accepts the exact same story as being true. That's what makes it so complicated. On top of that, uh, I would also like to state from the beginning that the Civil War is an interesting war, but this class is not a military history class. Unfortunately, I am not going to be discussing battle tactics or looking at uh, the minutia of the military and military life. That's not what this class is designed for. I'm not going to waste your time with it. If you really want to study that, I can point you in the direction of hundreds of books that do all of that, but that's not what you're going to be asked on the test. Instead, we have to think about what caused the Civil War to happen, which we should already know by this point, what uh, effects the Civil War had, and really, what effect does this have on the way the country is run and people living at home? That's always a big thing in the APUS world. How does this affect people that aren't actually fighting? So we're going to discuss all of those things in this chapter. Let's get started. Sure would be a shame if you had a war and nobody showed up, right? Well, that's the funny thing about the American Civil War. When this war breaks out, the United States doesn't have really that many trained soldiers. We haven't really fought a war in a little while, and we have, don't really have a lot of trained soldiers. And by the way, a good third of the soldiers that we did have that were trained are now going to be sent to the South. Oh, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and uh, say this now. Every now and then, I'm going to say we. When I say that, I mean the North. I don't usually associate myself with the South in this regard, so when you hear me say we or America... Just assume I'm using the word or saying the North. I'll do that a lot. What are you going to do? Okay. Um, the federal government by this time period, and by, oh, that's another one. When I say the word federal, federal also means the North. Sorry. Okay, back to work. The federal government had not levied a direct tax in years and had never instituted a draft before this time period. To make things worse, the South also had no tax structure, no navy, had limited uh, weapons, lacked railroads, lacked infrastructure. The South is really lagging behind. In fact, let's start talking about that. By April of 1862, the South has to enact a conscription law, which required all able-bodied men between the ages of 18 to 35 to serve in the military. Basically, the South needs soldiers. If we're going to fight a war, the South knows they're already at a numeric disadvantage. There are fewer people in the South than there are in the North. The North has more people, which means they have more soldiers, which means from that simple perspective, the North should win this war. So the South is basically going to require almost every single able-bodied male to go and fight. One caveat here. One little thing going on here. If you owned more than 20 slaves, the South passed a law called the 20 Negro Law, which says if you own more than 20 slaves, you are exempt from having to fight in the Civil War. Which essentially means if you're rich and wealthy and you have money, you don't have to fight. So the people that have the most vested interest in keeping slavery around 
are not the ones that have to actually fight in the Civil War. Hmm. Huh. There's a saying in war, it always it goes like this. This was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. That's what this means. The fact that um, the rich people want this war, especially in the South, the rich Southerners want this war, but the poor people are going to be the ones that fight it. Let's talk about supplies. The South is actually running low on supplies. The South had a weak manufacturing base because the South doesn't have infrastructure. You don't really need roads or railroads or anything else when you're just shipping cotton. You don't need the infrastructure that the North has. The North is based off of making things and selling them to each other and trading them. That's the Northern economy. Well, the Southern economy is based off of making cotton and selling that somewhere else. There's less of a transportation network in the South, especially because all the places that people live are so far spread out. What this means is that the South has a weak manufacturing base, has very little infrastructure, and does not really have the ability to produce anything. The South has a whole bunch of cotton, which is great. You do need cotton for clothing during the Civil War. Unfortunately, the South doesn't really have an ability to make guns or bullets or pretty much any of the other things you would need to successfully fight a war. It's not going to work out too well for them. It also is unfortunate for the South that they have these big giant plantations, but they don't stop growing cotton. Cotton is how the South makes money, but you know what an army really needs to do well? It needs food. But the Southern plantation owners don't stop growing cotton during the Civil War. Had the South have grown food and had a little bit better manufacturing, we might all be speaking redneck right now. Think about it. Uh, let's talk about Southern financing. The South doesn't really have a lot of money. And on top of that, a big argument of the South is that um, individual states should be left alone to do their own thing. Well, one of the things that Americans have always hated, and especially they're going to hate in the South, is this idea of being taxed. Americans in general don't like paying taxes, but people in the South are, at this time period, are especially against doing that. So the South has a really serious money problem. In fact, one of the biggest reasons why they lose is that they don't have the actual capital. The South is going to just print paper money. Now, we can get into a big long discussion of how economics works, but I'll make it simple like this. If your country is poor, you can't just print money to make it better. Because what happens is the value of that money is less and less and less. So um, it might make sense, I don't know, oh, the country's low on money, let's just print more. The problem is that paper money becomes less and less valuable the more of it you have. So the South during the Civil War starts printing a whole bunch of money, but it doesn't do any good because you can't buy anything with it. Inflation rose over 9,000%. There's going to be riots in the South about this later, but we'll get there. Now, there's one thing the South does have uh, in abundance, and that is good leadership. If you look at the North and the South when this war breaks out, the South has better military leadership. The better military minds are in the South. And on top of that, there's actually, you're more likely, if you're in the South, to have actually used and fired a gun. So the soldiers have that going for them as well. The South also has a military heritage, if that makes sense. People in the South were proud of service in the military. So the Southerners actually have that one thing going for them. They actually have the smarter generals. They have the more capable soldiers in the South as well. That's actually going to work out well for them. So that's the South. The South uh, does not have a good manufacturing. The people might have their own guns and might know how to fire them. But uh, the South itself cannot make really more weapons for its own soldiers. In fact, many of the Southern soldiers um, are going to take supplies from dead Union soldiers. There's actually stories of Civil War soldiers in the South having one pair of boots for the entire four years, and then when they would kill a Northerner, they would take his boots, or really any supply off of them. So it became a serious problem. The North has some other issues going on. 
Let's talk about the North. So let's talk about the North. Basically, the best way to think about the North in this war is that all the problems the South has, the North doesn't. The South lacks money. The North has plenty of money during this war. The South lacks soldiers and has to basically have nearly 80% of all Southerners fight in the Civil War. The North has plenty of available soldiers. The South lacks supplies. The North has a lot of supplies. So basically, you can think of the North and the South as being the exact opposite in this war. Um, let's go through each thing about the North. The North has significantly more people to call on, so recruiting is less of an issue. But there are two vocabulary words when it comes to getting soldiers to fight in this war. Um, even the North, despite the fact that they have more people, the North is still going to call for a draft. Otherwise known as a conscription law, if you want to get technical. Now, just like in the South, where people didn't want to fight if they had a lot of slaves, in the North, they don't want to fight either. Heck, if a war were to break out right now and there was a draft, I'd try to find some way out of it. So how do Northerners get out of fighting the war if they are drafted? If they are told they have to fight, how do Northerners get out of it? There's two ways. Number one, called substitution. You pay someone to serve for you. So, for example, if I got drafted, I would um, pay Eichen to go fight for me and say his name is Mr. Mullen. Okay? Next, commutation. Basically, if I got a draft notice, I would write a check to the U.S. government for, in this, at this time period, 300 bucks. That way I don't have to fight. So again, if you are wealthy and you have money, you can make it out of having to fight in the Civil War if you're in the North or the South. The North is actually very fortunate when it comes to manufacturing. Because the North has an industrial base and a manufacturing base, and they actually make things, the North is going to be able to produce 97% of the guns, 94% of the clothes, and 90% of all the shoes used in the Civil War. The North had the ability to produce thousands or even millions of any product quickly. That's going to be a huge advantage when a war breaks out. There's a story that's, uh, that goes around the North um, that says there was some battle coming up, maybe it was Gettysburg or Fredericksburg or something, and the North was running low on shoes. So the, the Union General um, basically sends a telegram back home and says, hey, we need shoes. Two days later, one million pairs of shoes shows up. That's what the North can do. The South can never get that kind of supplies. In fact, there's actually a story that um, the South actually traded cotton with the North that way the South would get military supplies and the North would have cotton. Seems strange, doesn't it? But it's true. Fortunately for the North, they had a lot larger of a um, tax base. So money is less of an issue for the North. But then again, war is really expensive. So we're still going to have to find a way to actually raise finances. Um, the North is going to sell these things called war bonds, which are essentially going to be you pay the government money and um, the government gets to keep that in their war account. And then one day they pay you back. It's like a loan. Um, early in 1862, Lincoln's going to authorize the Legal Tender Act. Uh, this is going to uh, have printed paper money uh, for use instead of paying soldiers in gold. So one of the big reasons, actually, that we use a lot of paper money today as opposed to gold is because... Uh, during the Civil War, it wasn't really practical to pay soldiers in gold and to have them have that in their uniforms and stuff. Instead, let's pay them with paper currency instead. It made it a legal tender that soldiers can use, and now it's pretty much common practice for you guys. I'm sure none of you are actually carrying gold to go pay for your lunches on campus, right? Didn't think so. The North's biggest liability in this war is their leadership. Lincoln had never served in the military and does not have a strong military background. Um, Lincoln had very little executive experience and he had very little, uh, even like the people in his cabinet didn't have a lot of leadership experience either. So really, Lincoln's kind of going in uh, really with not his best uh, troops. 
The North does not have a military heritage. The uh, If people work in a factory all day, they're probably not going to be hunting for their own food like they are in the South. So most Northerners don't actually own their own gun. And if they do, they probably don't really shoot it. It's the exact opposite of a military heritage. The North is not super militarized where the South really is. Point here being that... Um, Northern soldiers are less equipped and less prepared to fight than the average Southern soldier. If that wasn't bad enough, enough, the North is actually going to do pretty poorly when this war first starts out, and a lot of people are going to blame Lincoln for it, especially these people called radical Republicans. The entire time Lincoln is in office, he's going to be criticized by Republicans who say he's not doing the right thing. People in Lincoln's own party are going to criticize him the entire war for not doing enough. How on earth can that be? I thought Lincoln was the greatest president ever. Well, we're going to talk about him as we keep going. Um, but you might have a different opinion of Lincoln by the end of this chapter. So wait a second. Before I start discussing this war, let's talk about like the issues the North must have. Like, if the North had more soldiers, if they had more supplies, even with bad leadership, how on earth is it possible for the North to nearly lose this war? You guys have the benefit of living in the future, and you know how this war turns out. But at the time, the North is doing very, very terribly during this war. So how is it possible that the North might even face even the possibility of losing? Well, here's the North's problem. They have to force the South to come back. Like, it's not just as simple as, oh, we beat you up enough that made you a bunch of people die. That's not good enough. The North has to actually defeat the South so handily, and the South has to be hurt so bad that they're willing to come back. This is a civil war because it's a war between a country. This country is fighting itself. This is not a war against some foreign country full of people that we don't like. This is a war between family. And it's going to be a lot more difficult to bring this family back. The North also has to attack the South over a vast area. It's not just enough to attack, attack Richmond, Virginia and call it a day. The North has to bring back all of the South, and the South is a pretty large territory at this time period. Okay, Mullen, I've listened to you for almost 18 minutes. I'm sick of hearing about the setup. Let's get to the war. All right, geez, we'll get to the war. Um, <laughs> the first thing Lincoln has to do is he has to secure his border. What I mean by that is, the first thing that Lincoln needs to make sure that he gets done is that he wants to make sure that the capital is safe. In case you weren't paying attention, Washington, D.C. is very, very close to the south. In fact, technically, it's in the state of Virginia. I don't want to get into it, but it is. Okay, So, that means that the United States Capitol during the Civil War was actually in Confederate territory. That's kind of a problem. So the very first thing Lincoln needs to do, he needs to secure the White House, and then once he does that, he needs to secure the border of the North. Remember, the North and South touch each other. We have to find a way to secure this region. The first thing Lincoln does, he takes every available soldier in the United States and brings them to Washington, D.C. Now, um, on top of that, Lincoln... Once he secures his own capital, he wants to make sure that the area right next to the capital is also securely in the north. That area, of course, is a little state called Maryland. So what does he do? Lincoln basically sends his soldiers into the state of Maryland and tells the state of Maryland, you can't secede. In fact, he suspends every single person in the state of Maryland. He suspends every single person's right to habeas corpus. Habeas corpus basically means you have to be told why you were arrested. So what Lincoln does, he basically puts the entire state of Maryland under arrest. That way Maryland can't secede and join the South. Yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Lincoln is essentially going to arrest an entire state and then never tell them why they're arrested and never give the state a trial. Because of this, Maryland and nearby Delaware do not secede, even though both of those regions actually had slaves during the entire Civil War. 
something to think about. I'm sure you're asking yourself, Mullen, is that even legal? Can the president do that? Well, the Supreme Court's going to jump in, and they have a ruling which is called Ex Parte Merriman. Here's what it says. The Supreme Court rules that Lincoln is abusing his executive powers. Lincoln is going to say, hey, look, we're in a war right now, and the Constitution doesn't really apply when we're in a war. So we're going to put that little Constitution thing off to the side, and I'm going to make sure that I save as many American lives as I can, and hopefully end this war as quickly as I can. We're going to go ahead and forget about that whole little Constitution thing. In fact, Lincoln basically says, hey, you know what? If you want to make this Supreme Court ruling, that's all fine and good, but you better take care of it yourself because I'm not going to do it. If you don't like it, come at me, bro. And you know what? The Supreme Court really kind of doesn't. They kind of just let off the gas and say, okay, this is a war. I guess we'll just let it slide. Civil liberties tend to go down during wartime. Let me show you a map of what I mean here. Hopefully that'll make, it, make this whole thing a little bit more clear. Washington, D.C. is hiding where that star is. You'll notice that star is pretty darn close to Virginia, um, which is going to be a little scary because that's where a majority of the Civil War battles are going to be held and where a majority of the Southerners in the South even live. That's really close. So that's why Washington, D.C. is going to try to base, or sorry, why Lincoln is going to try to secure Washington, D.C. and to keep these border states in. You see how these border states are shaded? Well, you'll notice something kind of strange. Missouri is a border state. They stay in the Union the entire Civil War. Kentucky, another place we find rednecks, yeah, that stays in the North the entire Civil War, as does West Virginia. These places that we don't usually associate with the uh, most intelligent of people, if you're listening from those states, go ahead and close this out. Okay, bye. Um, <laughs> but you'll notice that those areas are going to stay in the uh, Union the entire um, Civil War. Why is that? Lincoln's going to fight really hard to basically make it so that way they can't leave. He needs them. He needs them to stay safe. Let's continue on. War is really expensive, so I'm not really a big fan of it. Of course, there's also the old, you know, people dying thing. But my biggest complaint is about the expense. Um, <laughs> with that being said... Um, the interesting thing about war is how war changes technology. One of the best things that come out of war is going to be the advancement in technology and, in the case of the Civil War and World War I and World War II, the advancement in medical technology. Um, the Civil War is really the first modern war. The American Civil War is the first war to use railroads, telegraphs, mass-produced weapons, iron warships, rifles, and trench warfare. All of that starts with the Civil War. Well, what's so important about the rifle, you may ask? The rifle is actually going to change warfare. Back in the day, what you would see is you'd have, a, uh, you'd have two groups of people, like in the American Revolutionary War, you'd have two groups of people standing pretty far apart from each other. They would take muskets and they would try to shoot at each other and it didn't really work. What ended up happening is that a lot of the um, fighting in early wars used to be a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the Civil War, that changes. We've invented a new gun, which has better accuracy and further range. So not only are you more likely to hit your target, you don't need to be as close to them. In fact, fewer than 1% of all military deaths during the Civil War come from hand-to-hand -hand combat. Pretty much every death in the Civil War is going to come from a bullet being fired a couple hundred feet away. What changes? What made that happen? That was the rifle. Um, let me show you what this would look like on the next slide. So this picture is from a uh, Civil War reenactment that I attended. You could tell because there are cars. But what you'll notice is that you see there are two groups of soldiers. The ones uh, closer to you are going to be the Union soldiers, and the ones in the distance are the Confederate soldiers. But what you'll notice is that they're kind of lined up at a pretty far distance. This is a couple foot, this is about a football field, maybe two football fields of distance between these two groups, and they're going to be firing at each other and slowly but surely walking closer and closer over the period of about half an hour. That's how most of these battles tended to go. You can see where the rifle is going to uh, play a lot of, um, you know, a big advantage here. Let's talk about the tactics of this battle, of this war, I should say. <clears throat> the South is very heavily forested. So surprise attacks were actually easy to arrange. 
In fact, sometimes the northern and southern armies would be so close to each other um, that they would be less than 100 feet from each other and wouldn't even know it. And in fact, there's a couple of battles of the Civil War that break out because one soldier is like going to the bathroom and happens to see the other army less than 100 feet away. That's how heavily forested the South is. So the North has to figure out a way to encompass the entire South to hopefully um, force them to submit. The way the North decides to do it is by this plan called the Anaconda Plan. The idea is to circle the entire Confederacy and then bite off the head of the Confederacy in Richmond. Um, the way that the North is going to do this, and the most successful way to do this, is to gain control to the Mississippi River, that is going to be vital, and to have control of the um, oceans that surround the South. The idea here, what the North is really going to plan to do, and the way the North ultimately wins this war, is by basically strangling the South. The idea here is the North's going to say, okay, we know the South has limited food and has limited supplies for war. So if we make it that way the South can't get any help, eventually they're just going to starve themselves to death. And really, that's how the North wins the Civil War. We find a way to make the South basically run out of supplies, and then once they're all starving and the fighting's no longer worth it, the South just gives up. That's how we win. That's the basis of the Northern strategy, and it's also the basis of what we kind of call the Anaconda Plan. That's where it comes from. Okay, let's start talking about some battles. Let's start with uh, the first Battle of Bull Run. Now, what's interesting about this battle is that the people at this time period kind of thought the Civil War would be over in a week or two. Like, everyone thought, okay, they're going to have one battle, it'll be uh, whatever it is, and then uh, that'll be the end of it. Unfortunately, that's, that's not what happened. At the first Battle of Bull Run, um, it's basically going to be a big, giant, massive slaughter. Over 5,000 soldiers are going to die in the Battle of Bull Run from the north and the south. Combined, 5,000 die. But what's almost kind of sickening about it is that there were dozens of people that were sitting at the top of a hill sipping tea and having lunch, watching the battle. I'm like, oh, let's go out and have a nice little tea. It'll be a wonderful afternoon to get some entertainment, to watch a little battle, a little war. It'll be over before you know it, and then we can all go and have supper. Um, once the fighting actually broke out and there was bloodshed everywhere, in fact, they were saying the rivers were just awash with blood, the citizens realized, oh no, this will not be over quickly, and this is going to be a different kind of war. You all know that the Southern general at this time period is this dude named Robert E. Lee, so I'm not going to talk about him. Instead, I will mention the Northern general. The first of many Northern uh, generals during this war is a dude named General George McClellan. George McClellan is very good at training soldiers. He's really good at training an army. He's just not good at having that army, you know, fight. He's like a super cautious general. So think about it, guys. The North outnumbers the South almost four to one in most battles, yet we, sorry, the North keeps losing. Imagine if we played football games and Bonita had 50 players on the field and San Dimas only had 10 to 15. And still, despite that numeric superiority, Bonita kept losing the smudge pot. Eventually you go, what the heck is wrong with Benita to have such a numeric superiority and still keep losing? Congratulations. If that confuses you and that seems weird, that's because that's what the Civil War was like. It's the same thing. I know. McClellan, brilliant general in some regards, but super, super, I almost want to say timid. This is no better explained than something called the Battle of Seven Days. It didn't actually last seven days. But the story here is that the North has a huge numeric superiority over the South. The North is actually going to um, press the issue. And then McClellan gets scared. Oh, no, we don't have enough people. And he actually starts to retreat. He has three to four times the number of soldiers, isn't convinced that's enough, and starts to retreat. Well, he starts to retreat, then the South comes in and starts punching him in the face, and punching his soldiers, obviously, and things are not going well. 
How do you possibly lose when you have more soldiers than the other side? Who knows? McClellan even kept sending letters to Lincoln saying, hey, we're going to lose this war because you haven't given me enough soldiers. And Lincoln responds like, dude, you have five times the number of soldiers. How are you possibly losing? It's going to go on like this for most of the battles. In fact, up until about the year 1863, you know, so for the first year and a half of this war, that story I just told you is pretty much what you can fill in for every single battle, which is actually why we don't need to talk about that many of them. Let's keep moving on. You are looking at a picture from the bloodiest single day of the American Civil War. The plan here is that uh, Lee wants to invade Maryland to take over their farms and get some food. Um, the funny thing about this battle, actually, is that Lee had one of his uh, aides, like one of his advisors, copy down the plan and then hide the plans inside of a cigar box. Long story short, that cigar box was thrown out and a Union soldier came across that box and it's not like in a trash can or anything, but basically found it out in the woods. Um, the Union soldier brought the plans to McClellan and the Union prepares for battle. McCle the Union quote unquote wins this battle. Um, if you can call a, a battle with 24,000 soldiers wounded and 5,000 dead and the bloodiest single battle day in all of US history, if you can call that a victory, the North wins this battle. Unfortunately, McClellan does not press the advantage and he allows the South to retreat and to regroup. Lincoln is so furious about this battle, and he's so furious about how, really, just how bad of a general McClellan is, he fires him and says, get out of here, you suck. Let's get someone else. We'll talk about that someone else in just a minute. Lincoln is looking for a new general. He needs a new general because McClellan ain't cutting it. So, he looks out west. Things for the... Union are not going well on the East Coast. We're not beaten up on Lee. Despite a huge numeric superiority, we are not beaten up on Lee out East. But out West, on the Mississippi River, we actually are kicking some major butt. So, now that, we've, now that we have uh, started this war, we want to make sure that we gain control of the Mississippi River. We send a general named Ulysses S. Grant out there to gain control of this river. We're not going to talk about it, but there's this place called the Siege of Vicksburg. Long story short, it takes a while, but Ulysses S. Grant is essentially going to gain control of the Mississippi River. He's actually been very, very successful, and he's successful because he has a different military strategy. He is not just going to push for a victory. Instead, he wants to beat the South so handily that the South is forced to do something called unconditional surrender. In fact, when this war is over, mainly it's because of Ulysses S. Grant, and Ulysses S. Grant is going to demand one thing from the South, unconditional surrender. The South gets absolutely no say in what happens to them when this war is over because they are so handily beat by Ulysses S. Grant. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next couple of uh, slides. We're going to see how the North finally does do it. But the first thing the North needs is a good general, and that is Ulysses S. Grant. Before we continue on with the war, let's talk about what life would be like if you were a soldier. If you had to go back in time, would you want to fight in this war? The answer is no. What's daily life like for a soldier? It ain't pleasant. Hey, do yourself a favor, pause this slide and see if you can count the dead bodies. There's actually a thing in Civil War photography where you actually look and see how many dead bodies you can actually find in photographs. And then you have to ask yourself, back then it took between 30 and 60 seconds for a photograph to actually uh, make it onto a photo panel. It's, it's complicated, but it takes a while. So you'll notice we don't have any action shots from the Civil War. Instead, all the pictures we have are still with no movement. So you have to ask yourself, is this what this area actually looked like when the photographer got there? Or did the photographer move some of the bodies? I know that seems a little morbid, but it's actually true. Photographers during the Civil War would go and stage the bodies so that way they'd look better for the picture. Again, you'll notice there's no movement. There's nobody else around. 
This is just a scene of stillness. Anyway, what is life like for a soldier? Most of the people who fought in this war volunteered, and most of the people, when their enlistment was up, re-enlisted. Desertion was not a major problem for the North or the South at the beginning of this war. Life for the soldiers is not all that great, though. Soldiers from the North and the South don't eat all that well. They're going to live in really cramped conditions, and military training is very rigorous and exhausting, even if it's not very good. It is very rigorous. On top of that, there these areas are super unsanitary. Military camps quickly became inundated with fleas, ticks, flies, and rodents. There was actually going to be a huge outbreak of disease. Did you know that over three times as many men die from disease in the Civil War than from battle? You know the most common way to die? It was the contracted disease called cholera. Cholera is basically, uh, it's almost like a it's not really a parasite, but it is, that uh, comes from drinking water that is infected with fecal matter. So what would happen, because there isn't proper sanitation, men would go out into the woods, out near a stream, and go to the bathroom. Well, somebody, maybe a little bit further downstream, would decide, hey, you know what, I need a drink of water. They wouldn't boil that water ahead of time. They would drink it, and inside of that water that they just drank is some is basically fecal matter, and... Um, they drink that water and then it makes them super, super sick. Um, imagine having the worst, uh, diarrhea and the worst, uh, case of vomiting you've ever had at the same time. That's cholera. The most common way to die of, of cholera is to actually die of dehydration from throwing up so much. Sounds like a horrible, painful way to day, die, right? Welcome to the Civil War. That's how most of the Americans of the North and the South died during the Civil War, not from fighting. This is also a very literate war. We actually have a lot of information from these soldiers. The United States at this time period is one of the most literate countries in the world, so we as historians have the benefit of being able to look back and to see what these people actually thought and saw. That's why we know so much about this war, because we have so many primary sources for people that actually fought in it. What's interesting is that as this war was breaking out, the northern soldiers weren't really fighting for black liberation. But as the war goes on, more and more northern soldiers start to realize just how bad and how awful and wrong slavery really is. So this war becomes more about slavery as it's being fought, if that makes sense. Really, the northerners didn't know how bad slavery was until they saw it firsthand. Even the soldiers that are fighting in the Civil War weren't really sure how bad slavery was until they saw it. The South expected to get some help in this war, but they actually don't. The South really expected to have um, help from Europe in this war. The South basically expected Europe to be like, oh wow, the North sure is being mean to the South. And since we trade a lot with the South and we need the Southern cotton, we're going to be on the South side. That was the expectation that the Confederacy had during this war. And in fact, they called this cotton diplomacy. Because cotton was so vital to manufacturing and textiles in Europe, the South just expected Europe's help in this war. But the South doesn't get it. Why does Europe not help the South? Well... I can think of three reasons. Number one, Great Britain, especially, is going to find cotton supplies in other areas. Now, guys, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about, but girls, perhaps you've heard of something called Egyptian cotton? Ah, that's cotton from Egypt. So that there must be other places cotton can grow that, the, that Europe can get it from. Egypt and India is one of those, are those places. Number two, Great Britain actually doesn't need cotton as much during this time period. Great Britain goes through a famine. What Great Britain really needs during this time period is corn. But the South doesn't stop growing cotton. They keep growing, or sorry, yeah, the South doesn't stop growing cotton. Had they started of growing food, it would have helped the South, and the South could have helped Europe and maybe pressured Europe into helping. But see, 
The third reason why Europe does not help the South is perhaps the most poignant. Europe is anti-slavery. Europe banned slavery before the United States even existed as a country in 1776. Europe had already banned slavery. Europe didn't like slavery. They're not going to help a country that is going to perpetuate slavery when most of Europe has essentially already banned it by this time period. Once the North decides to tell the rest of the world that this war is really about slavery and not anything else, once that happens, Europe goes, okay, we are officially out. We want nothing to do with this. And they stay out because Europe is not big on slavery and the South is. But wait a second. Was the Civil War really about slavery? Wait a minute, Mullen. How could you say that? Of course the Civil War is about slavery. Well, it's tough. Now, the reason why I say it's tough is that there's more to the Civil War than just the fact that the South has slaves. Of course, that's like a huge chunk of it. But at the same time, we can't go through our life thinking that Lincoln was some sort of hero of all slaves. Because if you look at what Lincoln actually says, maybe that's not so much the truth. Let's take a look at the, a speech Lincoln gives in the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. I can't do a Lincoln impression, so I'll just read this in my voice. <clears throat> I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There is a physical difference between the two, which in my judgment will probably forever forbid their living together upon the footage of perfect equality. The Negro is not my equal in many respects, certainly not in color, perhaps not in moral or intellectual endowment, but in the right to eat bread which his own hand earns, he is my equal and the equal of every living man. So wait a second, does Lincoln agree with slavery or not? It's kind of an ambiguous statement here. He's essentially implying that whites and blacks are not equal and cannot be equal. But he also does say that slaves should have the right to live a good life. Something to think about. Speaking of, let's talk about what really changes the face of this war. It's this little thing called the Emancipation Proclamation. So the Emancipation Proclamation is one of the most misunderstood documents in all of U.S. history. Wait a minute, how can I say that? People always say that the three most important documents in U.S. history are the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Emancipation Proclamation. The thing is, the people that say that probably haven't read the Emancipation Proclamation because once you read it, this document seems a little strange. Now, before I go on, we are going to have an entire day in class about this, so if you have not had that day, please pause this lecture and wait until we read this document before you continue on. Okay? So I'm actually telling you to stop working ahead if that's what you are doing. Don't work ahead. Instead, I want you to be part of that activity and go into that with a fresh mind because it's going to be important. Now, if you did finish that activity, well, this is already going to be spoiled for you, but let's just continue the story. So where does this idea of emancipation or freedom actually come from in regards to the Civil War? Emancipation really comes about as a military tactic more than a social or a political one. What do I mean by that? Well, the North is going to face a problem. When the Union Army starts approaching these um, Confederate land holdings and they find all these slaves, well, if the South is still part of the United States, and if, as Lincoln argues, the South can't legally leave, which means that the South has no right to secede, which means that the people in the South are still U.S. citizens. You can't go taking U.S. citizens' property, even if they're at war with you. You can't go taking their property. And as we know, because of the Dred Scott decision, slaves are considered property. So the North has to do something when they encounter these slaves. They can't legally take the property just yet, so they have to do something else. 
At first, in 1861, the U.S. government passes something called the Confiscation Acts, which is going to make it legal for Northerners to take Southern property, including slaves. Wait a second, though. Does that mean those slaves are freed? No, that's not what that means at all. It just means that the Northerners can take that property. So wait a second. If this war is about slavery, what the heck is taking the Union so long? Why don't they just like already make an amendment to the Constitution saying that slavery is illegal and all slaves are freed and just end it already? What's the problem? Well, the problem is that there are slave states in the North during the Civil War. There's four of them. They're on the border. So you can't just make slavery legalized because you might tick off those states and then they might leave and then that becomes a, uh, a military disadvantage for the North. However, the North realizes that emancipating or freeing slaves could actually be a great military tactic. Think about it. If the slaves were free, they would leave the South, which would cripple it, especially its economy, and slaves on plantations would be likely to help the Northern Army or to even have little mini slave rebellions on their plantations, which would ultimately help the Union Army. So freeing slaves is really done, or is at least partially done, as a means of a military measure, not just a political or social one. In fact, Lincoln even says, if I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. After the successful Battle of Antietam, Lincoln is going to give the Emancipation Proclamation, which goes into effect on January 1, 1863. It states that slaves in the area of rebellion were considered to be forever free. The problem with the Emancipation Proclamation is that it lists a bunch of specific territories and states where this law is in effect. But if you list, look at it carefully, this law is actually not in effect in the North. In fact, the Emancipation Proclamation only frees slaves in the South, an area where some historians, especially Southern historians, would argue that Lincoln actually has no legal authority. It would be like President Obama, who was president when I recorded this, it would be like President Obama getting rid of drug cartels in Mexico. Well, you can say that, Obama, but you don't have any legal authority over Mexico, so you saying that doesn't make drug cartels go away. The Emancipation Proclamation is kind of the same way. Just because Lincoln said that slaves were free in the South doesn't mean they were, because he had no legal authority there. And in fact, the Emancipation Proclamation specifically excludes the places that Lincoln does have legal authority to get rid of slavery. You know, the North. Read it again. It might surprise you. However, even though the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't necessarily free slaves, if you read it word for word, the intent behind it does. Maybe Lincoln doesn't have the legal authority to free slaves in the South, but when slaves in the South hear about the Emancipation Proclamation, they're going to believe that they are free, and that's going to be just as important as them actually being free. Slaves are going to start having little mini insurrections and work stoppages, and really, it's going to push this war to be about slavery, which is going to go ahead and encourage Europe to uh, not help the South. This document does serve a very important purpose, even if it's not necessarily the purpose that most Americans today think it has. Again, most Americans today haven't read it. This document is super important, just maybe not for the reason you always thought. So you're probably asking yourself, what is the status of blacks during the Civil War? What is the status of black Americans during the American Civil War? Well, just like everything else in this class, it's, it's complicated. By 1865, over half a million former slaves were in the Union hands. Most of them fled to Union lines as soon as the Union Army came close. What starts to happen with many of the former slaves is that they're going to join work camps to work as cooks or as laborers because they were not allowed to serve in the military yet. Once the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, black Americans were finally able to serve in the American military, and many joined. 
I don't have the actual number right in front of me. It must be somewhere. Oh, here it is. Um, One-tenth of all Union soldiers are actually going to be black Americans, many of them former slaves. So it actually becomes a big part of the Union effort to have former slaves fighting for their own freedom. Now, unfortunately for these former slaves, once they leave the plantations, they expect the North to be some sort of a haven of racial equality, but that's not the case. In fact, many uh, former slaves are going to be treated just as poorly in the North as they were on the plantations. To combat this inherent racism, even in the North, the uh, Congress is going to pass something called the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, this is going to be an organization whose entire purpose is to educate black Americans and provide relief and employment to black Americans. Even after the Civil War is over, many people are going to try to take advantage of black Americans in the North and the South. And this program is going to be around for a good 15 years. And its sole purpose is to basically help black Americans um, reassimilate into American society that they have been basically blocked from for many years. Imagine it. Your entire life and your entire family's life has been in a state of perpetual lack of education. So now you're going to enter a society that actually is a very literate education-based society and you've never had access to education. Even as an adult, you're going to be very far behind. So the Freedmen's Bureau is designed, is designed to help close that gap. Let's talk about the black Americans that joined the Union Army because really... It's going to be the black Americans that join the Union Army after the Emancipation Proclamation that help turn the tide and help the Union Army win. Over 186,000 black men are going to fight for the Union Army during the war. That's one-tenth of all Union soldiers. Most white men, even in the North, were reluctant to allow blacks to serve in the Army. Um, so what starts to happen is that uh, black Americans are going to be forced to join their own regiments. One such regiment of all black soldiers was the Massachusetts 54th under the command of General Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw is a white man who was going to lead this group of all black soldiers. Perhaps you've heard of the movie Glory. The movie Glory tells the story of this specific regiment. Black Americans are going to suffer a higher mortality rate than whites, but not from actual battle, mainly from disease. Black soldiers have an even harsher thing to face than white soldiers. If a white soldier is caught by a Confederate, they're going to be kept as a prisoner of war and most likely exchanged um, in a one-to-one -one prisoner exchange, which is very common during wars of this time period. But if a black Union soldier is captured by the Confederacy, he's returned to the deepest part of the South to be right back on a plantation. So it's even scarier for a black soldier should they get caught. On top of that, black soldiers are going to make less than white soldiers. In fact, a black soldier makes only $10 a day, whereas a white soldier made $13 a day. This is actually not going to be fixed until the war is almost over. Um, so then why join? Why do black Americans join? It's because joining the military is going to be a way to prove that blacks deserve citizenship. Okay, let's get back to the battles. So, things have actually been going pretty bad for the North. In fact, for the first year and a half of this war, in fact, this is actually the second year of the war. So, for the first two years of this war, the North has essentially been losing almost every single battle. The South, despite having fewer people, despite having less food and fewer weapons, is actually beating the North. The South's starting to get a little confident, and now we're going to push for um, the South to actually invade the North. This is going to be called the Battle of Gettysburg, and it happens on July 1st through 4th, 1863. Here's the thing. General Lee is running out of food, so he needs to go into the North basically to raid a farm to get some food for his soldiers. Essentially, the Battle of Gettysburg breaks down to um, both sides meet in one place. Uh, the Union has the high ground, which is always important during a war, and the Confederacy is basically invading inward, and they're coming up the high ground. 
The reason why it's important to have the high ground in a war is that you can shoot downhill, your soldiers can stand still, while the other soldiers are going to get tired moving up that hill. So, the Union has the high ground, the Confederacy is trying to march in, and they are getting more and more exhausted and basically being shot over and over and over trying to do this. Um, perhaps you've heard of uh, this event called Pickett's Charge. Basically, this dude named General Pickett is going to decide to lead his troops into up, up this hill through a very small gate in a fence. Um, unfortunately for General Pickett, um, as all those soldiers are coming into one general spot, basically imagine a big wide swath of people being narrowed down to something the size of a doorway. Well, if you're fighting 15,000 people, that's really hard over a wide area. But if those 15,000 people have to walk through the same doorway, they're really easy to attack. So when the South does pick its charge, they start charging through an area not much wider than a couple of doorways. The Union Army just stands there, and it's almost like shooting fish in a barrel for the Union to kill Southerners. On the fourth day of the Battle of Gettysburg, coincidentally on July 4th, 1863, it rained. It's almost as if the heavens opened up and said, you know what? This is enough fighting for right now. Over 50,000 soldiers from the north and the south are going to be dead or injured. General Lee is going to retreat, but the Union general at the time does not follow. The victories at Gettysburg and some other victories out west are going to really improve American morale. And by American, of course, I mean Union. Union morale is going to greatly improve during the uh, after this battle. So we call this a turning point because things are finally starting to go well for the United States. After the Union victory, <clears throat> yeah, start over. La 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 la. After the Union victory at Gettysburg, the, the pace of the war tends to change. The actual number of battles start to go down a little bit. Battles per year go down. But what also starts to happen is that the fact that the North changes their strategy. Now, as you guys heard earlier on, the North had more soldiers and more supplies in the South, but they didn't use them very effectively. So now that's going to change. What's going to start happening now is that we have a new general. General Grant is now going to be in charge of the entire Union Army, and General Grant has a new philosophy for how to win this war. It's called a sustained offensive. Now, this doesn't mean walking by the, you know, freshman gym and how bad it smells in their locker room. No. What a sustained offensive is, even if the North loses a battle, they're not going to retreat. In fact, the way that most Civil War battles tended to go was one side would walk up to the other side, they'd fight for a while, both sides would kind of retreat, then they'd meet again a couple weeks later somewhere else. General Grant is going to do something different. Even if he loses, he's going to keep his troops advancing on the South. The idea is Grant's going to use his numer numeric superiority to basically keep the South fighting. That way the South never gets the chance to take a break. They never get to rest. I can make a whole bunch of sports analogies behind this for those of you that watch different sports like hockey or soccer. But the basic point here is he's going to tire out the other team. Three battles happen in a row. The Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Cold Harbor. The Union loses all three of these battles. They get beaten every single time in these battles. But why they matter is the fact that normally the Union would just retreat. But this time, when the Union loses a battle, they keep attacking the South. And they follow the South. They don't let the South get time to regroup. And eventually, the, the Southern Army, even though they're winning, they start to run low on supplies. Uh, the soldier morale starts to go down, and really the South almost feels like giving up. Ironically, even though the North is losing these battles and thousands of American so uh, uh, soldiers are dying, morale goes up in the North. They're like, yeah, this is going to work. This is going to work. Hundreds of people are dying every single day, but this is going to work simply because the North has more soldiers to lose than the South does. In fact, by doing this, in six weeks... General Grant loses 42,000 men, but morale is going to improve. There's another reason why morale is going to prove, improve, and there's another reason why the North is starting to look really confident in this war. There's another general 
and he's a little crazy. His name is General Sherman. General Sherman is going to be the Union general that's going to be fighting actually in the South. Uh, general Grant and General Meade have been up in the North, but what's going to start to happen now is that um, General Sherman is given new orders. His new orders are basically involved starting in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and basically taking his group of soldiers and walking through the South and destroying everything they see. This means uh, plantations that they see, railroad tracks that they see, infrastructure that they see, cities that they see. They're going to basically burn them to the ground. Sherman's going to lead 98,000 men through um, Georgia and uh, capture the city of Atlanta. Then he's going to burn it to the ground. Then he's going to capture the city of Savannah, Georgia, and burn it to the ground. Then he starts making his way... Once he hits the Atlantic Ocean, he starts to make his way north. So imagine this if you are a uh, Confederate soldier in Virginia. You hear the stories of this man who is basically rampaging the South, destroying railroad lines, essentially making the South a deserted wasteland and leaving nothing but flames and destruction in his path. You're fighting in Virginia, and now you're starting to wonder, is my plantation okay? Is my property okay? Has something happened to my property? Or is my wife and kids okay? Start to get a little concerned um, about stuff like that, right? What starts to happen because of General Sherman is that really he brings a total war to the South, total destruction on all members of the South, not just soldiers. But this really starts to hurt Confederate morale. People are afraid of this guy, and you would be too. He's basically making a 10-mile wide cut, um, 10 miles um, wide and over over 300 miles long, I believe is what, is what I've read. Um, this is a huge swath that, he's, that he is basically taking through the South. He destroyed over $100 million worth of property. He gives a very famous quote about his tactics and what he is doing and why he thinks it's necessary for this war to ultimately end. Here's what he says. War is cruelty and you cannot refine it. Those who brought war into our country deserve all the curses and maledictions a people can pour out. He's basically saying, hey, if you don't like my tactics, tough, you brought this on yourself. It's kind of like, you know, when you have an older sibling and they hold back your head and they grab your fist and start smacking you in the head and go, why are you hitting yourself? Sherman's basically like that to the South. Why are you hitting yourself? You made me do this to you. It's your own fault. And his success in the South is going to lead to the ultimate Union victory. Here's how it goes down. So pretend you are General Robert E. Lee of the South. You have General Grant, who even though you're punching him in the face over and over and over and beating him up, he still keeps attacking you. He's like Rocky at the end of all the Rocky films. You know, like in Rocky IV, when Rocky is getting his face pummeled in by the Soviet uh, Ivan Drago. And even though Rocky should just basically just stop for his own safety and his own mental health, he still keeps fighting no matter how bloody he gets. Okay, that's the North in the American Civil War. On top of that, now you have this crazy general in the South who's basically destroying everything he sees and destroying as much property and has no concern over how much he destroys, and he's coming up from the South um, to attack you. So basically, General Lee and his army, even though they're winning right now, are being sandwiched by two crazy, crazy generals. It gets to a point where General Lee realizes that he needs to surrender, that this has gone on too long. What's interesting about this surrender is that this is going to be a surrender, a military surrender. General Lee is going to surrender to General Grant. But wait a minute, this is a war. And like, shouldn't Abraham Lincoln be talking to Jefferson Davis? Here's the funny thing. Lincoln never recognizes the South as ever existing, so he never meets with the Confederate delegation. He doesn't talk to the South. He will not accept the South's surrender in this war. Instead, he has General Grant accept their surrender, and then Lincoln just goes, oh, good, they're not fighting us anymore? Great, now we can go back to normal. 
That's all Lincoln ever wanted. He just wanted the country to stay together. He didn't want to break the family up. On April 9, 1865, at the Appomattox Courthouse, Lee officially surrenders to Grant. Grant is going to allow Lee to have full military honors, even though he was a rebel. Um, Grant um, also gave Lee and his men money for food. Uh, sorry, money and enough food to get home. And within a month, all Confederate resistance had ceased. And not a single person was ever prosecuted for treason. Not a single Confederate was prosecuted for treason. Basically, the South surrendered. General Grant goes, okay, go home. And they go home. In fact, when the South surrendered, there was a big party that night. And the North and South partied together around the Appomattox Courthouse. And they celebrated this war being done. The, the Confederates dropped their guns, turned around, and went home. And this war ended. Just like that. That's not to say that this war didn't have a significant impact. Over 620,000 men died. That's more than all of the other U.S. wars combined. Including civilians, over 1 million people died, or just about 3% of the total U.S. population of that time period. 60% of all of the wealth of the South disappeared. This war also uh, jump-started the uh, Industrial Revolution and made us a more industrial nation. And slavery is going to be abolished, and 3.5 million slaves will be freed. We'll talk about that in a second. But perhaps the most important uh, aspect of this war, besides, of course, the slavery thing, uh, one of the discussions we've had this entire year so far in this class has been the growth of federal power. We've had a bunch of discussions about the federal government being more powerful than the states, but the states keep challenging it. We talked about McCullough versus Maryland and Gibbons versus Ogden. We've talked about even things like the Dred Scott decision. What the Civil War proves is that the federal government is stronger than the state governments. A state can't nullify anything. A state can't disagree because this is what happens when a state disagrees. Why will we probably never have another civil war? Why will the states always toe the line and not challenge the U.S. government? Because this is what happens when you do. This war asserts the federal government's authority over the states. And really, ever since then, this authority has not been questioned by the states. When the federal government says something, the states go along with it. Unfortunately, though, the AP exam might not ask you, or really it won't ask you, anything about the battles of the Civil War. Instead, it's going to ask you about stuff like this. What were the economic impacts of the Civil War in the North and the South? Well, the North is going to face an economic boom, mainly because the North makes a lot of military weapons, like guns and shoes and uniforms. What starts to happen is that those industries make a lot of money, obviously. Um, the U.S. government during the Civil War is going to decide, hey, remember that Transcontinental Railroad? Let's actually build that thing. And since we're funding it and we're the North, let's build that railroad through the North. Um, another thing that the North wants to do during the Civil War is they want to encourage Americans to move out West. The logic being that if the U.S. government basically just gives free land to people to move out west, those people are going to be from the north, they won't have slavery, and it will just have even more people out on the hard-to-control frontier actually be supporters of the north. So there are going to be two different acts that are done to basically encourage northerners to move west, even during the Civil War. The first one's called the Homestead Act of 1862. It gave settlers 160 acres of land for free once they lived there for five years. By the way, an acre of land is about the size of a football field, so you're going to get 160 acres of free land if you just move out to Oklahoma. 160 acres of free land, by the way, that's larger than uh, Disneyland and California Adventure put together. That's, that's how much land that is. It's a lot. 
the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862 is going to give public lands over to states in order to build colleges. Places like Michigan State, Iowa State, and Purdue all come from this Land Grant Act. Let's talk about the economic impact in the South. The war destroyed the Southern economy. The infrastructure of the South is going to be destroyed. Railroads are going to be destroyed. Cotton output is going to drop by 93%. There's going to be a scarcity of food and a scarcity of labor in the South. Riots actually break out because there isn't enough bread to feed families in the South. The South keeps growing cotton, even though there's no profit in it during this time period. The South keeps growing cotton as opposed to growing food. The South is going to face huge desertion problems as this war continues because men needed to go home and feed their families. By 1864, nearly half of the Confederate army had deserted. The North is actually going to trade with the South during this entire war. The North needs cotton, and the South needs food. Wait a minute, why on earth would the North give supplies to the South? Because this is a civil war. This is a war between family. This isn't necessarily a war between your enemies of some foreign country that you don't know. This is brother versus brother. This is going to sound strange, but northerners and southerners wanted the other side to die, but not suffer. Think of it as you have an elderly relative. You want them to die peacefully. You don't want them to suffer in the process. So that's kind of how this is going to go. The North, the north is actually going to trade food with the South because the North doesn't want the South to suffer. They just want them to give up and die. We talk about every election in this class, so let's talk about the election of 1864. To me, this election is pretty important because it's actually an election that's held during the middle of a big, scary war. Lincoln could have just as easily have said, you know what, we're going to suspend the elections. It's too dangerous a time. But he actually keeps the election going, even if the South doesn't get to vote. Um, so Lincoln's going to win re-election. Um, and more importantly, around this same time period is when the United States government is finally going to install the 13th Amendment. What's the 13th Amendment, you ask? That is the amendment that officially abolishes slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation came a year and a half before this. It does not abolish slavery. The 13th Amendment officially abolishes slavery in the United States. But I can't end a story of the Civil War without talking about, really, the end point of the Civil War. It's almost kind of poignant how this happened, because it basically kind of accurately shows um, a good ending point to the story. You almost couldn't write a better ending than this. I didn't say a happier ending, I said a better ending. So, what happened to poor Abraham Lincoln? Well... A couple of days after the South surrendered, Abraham Lincoln decides, you know what, I've been working pretty hard, it's a Friday night, I should go and see a play. And on April 14th, 1865, on Good Friday, no less, Abraham Lincoln decides to go and see a play. The play is called Our American Cousin, and it is a comedy. Meanwhile, a Confederate sympathizer, who was also an actor, named John Wilkes Booth, plans a major conspiracy He's uh, against the, the northern government. He is so upset that the Confederacy um, essentially gave up and quit this war that he says he thinks if he makes a plan to kill everyone in the presidential cabinet, that would basically encourage the South to restart the war. So Booth goes through with this plan. Um, he gets a couple of his buddies together. A couple of his buddies go and attack the Secretary of State, William Seward, and uh, Booth's job is to assassinate President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Booth is an actor at this time period, so him walking around Ford's theater is not so out of, out of place. So he decides to um, make his way into the theater and go up to the presidential booth where the president is sitting. He walks up behind him, holds a gun to his head, waits for an appropriate line in the play, and fires. What line did he wait for? Oh, he waited for the punchline. You see, John Most Booth had previously starred in Our American Cousin, and he had it memorized. He actually waited 
for a moment when the audience would be laughing to shoot the gun. That way nobody would hear him do it. He fires the gun and then he jumps off of the balcony railing and lands on stage. He shouts, Sic Semper Tyrannis, which of course is Latin, which means, as always, to tyrants. And he runs off stage. It's a little bit after that that people realize, oh crap, the president has been shot. Um, the next day, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln dies uh, from bleeding to death. But he was unconscious the entire time. And in fact, I like to think of it this way. The last thought that Abraham Lincoln had before he died was laughter. The last thing he heard before he died was a joke. Perhaps he earned that after the Civil War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's going to die the next day on April 15th. Booth is going to escape, and there's going to be a federal manhunt to basically hunt him down. He's going to be captured on April 26th, where he hides in a barn, and then that barn is burned to the ground. Um, as the barn is burning, he walks out, and he's going to be shot by federal officers. Now, if you feel bad for Abraham Lincoln, you should. It, it stinks to get shot. But, had Booth not have killed Lincoln, Lincoln may have died in office anyway. Um, historians argue that he probably had less than a year of life left after the Civil War because he was actually dying of cancer. So, Abraham Lincoln may have died anyway, mainly because of cancer. And some historians even argue that Abraham Lincoln wasn't super popular in the South. In fact, or in the North, I should say. In fact, Many people say that the best thing that Abraham Lincoln did was actually die because he became a martyr and like he becomes a martyr for the uh, eventual emancipation and the civil rights for black slaves. In fact, even though if you look at the things that Lincoln says and does, he doesn't seem like that big of an advocate for slaves. In fact, Frederick Douglass even says slaves were merely the stepchildren of Lincoln. So despite all of that, Lincoln is respected and revered so much for the Civil War and for ending slavery in America. But really, at the time period, he wasn't that well loved. It wasn't until he was assassinated that people started to think of Lincoln in a more positive light. And that's kind of where this mentality about Lincoln comes from, even today. Wow, that was a long chapter. I hope we all learned a lot. See you in class. Good luck on the test.